The first thing to understand about flying is that it's pretty much the fastest way to burn fossil fuels and produce greenhouse gas. For example, a return flight from Europe to New York generates roughly the same amount of emissions as the average European heating their home for an entire year. The next thing to understand is that it's relatively wealthy, high income, high emitting individuals and countries that fly the most. Yet it is the relatively low income, low emitting individuals and countries that bear the brunt of the health impacts and the climate impacts from aviation emissions, particularly in the global south where people fly less. One of the key points introduced by the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement was the principles of equity and fairness when it comes to reducing emissions. That is, the higher income countries and individuals should take action much faster than the lower income countries and individuals. So in countries like the UK, where we have a very high per capita number of flights, if we are still expanding our airports, if we're still seeing more and more air traffic growth, then clearly we're breaking our commitments. Aviation is the pinnacle of climate injustice and emissions inequality. For example, only 1% of the global population produces over half of aviation emissions. 80% of the world have never actually stepped foot on an aircraft, and even in countries like the UK, it's a very small proportion, about 15% of the population, that produce 70% of the aviation emissions. And private aviation is the absolute peak of those injustices. For example, a private jet is about 10 times as carbon intensive as a normal airliner, and about 50 times as carbon intensive as traveling by train. And just a four hour flight in a private jet produces the same amount of emissions as the average person does in an entire year. This means we have a very small minority of very wealthy individuals with a carbon footprint that is far higher than the average person. For example, Bill Gates has a carbon footprint that is three and a half thousand times higher than the global average required for us to remain under 1.5 degrees of global warming. Now, you may have heard people such as Bill Gates tell you that technology and innovation is the answer rather than reducing flying. Well, I'm an aerospace engineer. I used to work for Rolls-Royce designing aircraft engines for the likes of Boeing and Airbus. And I can tell you that the conversations that we were having within the industry were very different to the misleading misinformation that was being shared with the public and with the media about what was possible with technology. For example, electric and hydrogen aircraft just can't compete with jet fuel powered aircraft in terms of range and payload, so the distance they can travel and the number of people they can carry. There's also a massive issue of timescales. Hydrogen aircraft will take at least 15 years to design, develop and certify before we even see one aircraft in service. And we're likely to have blown our carbon budget for 1.5 degrees C or even 2 degrees C by that point. Then you've got these so-called sustainable aviation fuels. So you've got things like biofuels, you've got electrofuels produced from electricity. But the reality is we have a very limited global resource of renewable energy and biomass, and we can't afford to waste that producing aviation fuel, which is very energy intensive to produce and then burn it immediately in aircraft rather than use it for more distributed uses such as replacing fossil fuel fertilizer that's used in agriculture to grow food, ground transport, so cars and buses, and heating people's homes. Okay, so technology won't save us. What should the government do? Well, the key thing to understand when it comes to policies is that aviation fuel is currently tax-free. Meanwhile, petrol and diesel at the fuel pump is currently taxed at greater than 50% versus that 0% tax for aviation fuel. This means if you're unemployed or if you're a minimum wage worker and you're driving to work 
you're driving to the shops, you're picking your kids up from school, you're paying a very high rate of tax on your fuel. Meanwhile, frequent flyers and the millionaires or billionaires that are flying around in private jets are doing so tax-free. Meanwhile, though, they're doing more environmental destruction in one day than you're doing in an entire year. Then there's carbon offsetting. And I think, well, at least I hope by this point, most people understand that carbon offset schemes are at best ineffective and at worst actively dangerous. But you might have heard people talking about something called negative emissions, such as direct air capture. These sorts of things propose that we'll suck carbon out of the air and store it back underground. However, this technology is yet to be demonstrated at any significant scale. There's also huge associated risks around the immense quantity of energy, land, water, etc. that they use. They may actually exacerbate climate change. And then there's the point about who's actually going to pay for this? Because under current policies, most aviation emissions are not priced. So it's going to be future taxpayers that are paying for negative emissions. Basically, our children. This represents a huge intergenerational injustice. And already, the UK government has awarded millions to fossil fuel companies like Shell for pilot projects for these schemes. So my takeaway message is that we need far stronger policies to reduce frequent flying and to curtail the use of private jets. We also need to make sure the polluter pays. That is, high income, high emitting frequent flyers should pay for the costs of aviation emissions that are currently burdened on the rest of society. Now this is exactly what the UK Citizens Assembly on Climate Change recommended to the UK government. So they should listen to them.